guns. Were the streets on fire? Streets were on fire through the streets. Bombay Street was there was there was there was twenty six houses of Bombay Street at the back of Clonard Monastery burnt to the ground. And we barely kept them out. They were heading for Clonard Monastery to burn down Clonard Clon Clon Monastery. They were heading into the short strand to burn down St Matthew's Chapel and St Matthew's Hall and they burned the people out of the short strand. And how did they burn them? You know, Petrol bombs. Petrol bombs. They, they came equipped? Yes. They mm. do it. They didn't just come with a box of magic. They came mm. equipped to do it, to burn the people out. Mm. Astoria Gardens on, on, on our dying was burnt to the ground. And and, uh, and then people that were living in, living in down in places like Rathcool, Catholics that were living down on the shore road or not in parts of North Belfast were forced out of their homes and we had to go and get them in lorries and bring them out and trans salvage would be cut out of the burnt homes as well. Like every lorry, we had four lorries in our business, every one of those lorries was used to evacuate people out of, out of their homes to try and get them into Catholic districts where they'd be safe. And were there many of the, we call them the invaders in it, many people coming to burn yours? Oh there was the gangs of them, there was, you know, they, and they were supported by the RUC. Yeah. That was the big part. The RUC is Shortland Armoured Cars, mm. which were Land Rovers, the armoured car, armoured Land Rovers, mm. that they used. And the, the Bren guns on the top of them, that's what they were using. And mm. they attacked the Catholic positions from there. Because they thought if they had attacked the Catholic positions in, in West and North Belfast, the people in Derry would have backed off because they were getting, they were getting beaten in Derry. Mm. So to, to get a diversion from Derry, they started in the north in, in, in Belfast, and we had nothing to fight back with, because hmm. there was no IRA. The IRA had been stood down, and Cathal McGuilla and 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 and, and uh, Garden had sold the guns or destroyed any guns they had, so there was no. They're going down the peaceful road, as we tried in 1974 with Billy McMillan. That's what that was all about, and to stand up and go for an election in West Belfast and try and win that seat as Sinn Féin. And then you have the pasty thing. And that was my fault, as I said to you earlier, grabbed me with the scruff and brought me home to <laughs> 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 So 1969 came and, and then it started the start of the the start of the, the formations of the provisionals. I went through that with you to a degree. And then the war started after the war really started after internment. And internment was the last straw. As I said, they missed me uh, through my sister from America got me saved. And I was left alone and I went out and did what I had to do, man the barricades. But I set up the medical systems as well. And um, I saw a little bit of active service at that stage as well. But it was more to, to as a protection active service than as an aggressive active service. So I'm seeing what I'm saying that. And I'm going to say something that's going to shock you. And I've never spoken about this before. Never. This is something that I have never actually admitted to or said before. In 1972, I was walking down the New Lord's Road with the parish priest out of St. Patrick's Church in Donegal Street. And there was a British Army patrol on my left hand side, on the other side of the street. And there was three or four of them behind me, here. And the shot rang out and the soldier over there went down. And the automatic reaction of the priest was to go to him and give him whatever he could give. And he knew my background and he dragged me with him. And I ran the first aid to the soldier. I took his wound bandage off his belt. Now I could do nothing for him because he was hitting the stomach and his coming, he was probably ripped apart inside. And he was probably, I don't know why he said that, probably didn't. But the priest gave him absolution and gave him what, what a priest does. That was the first time. There was two other incidents of that, where I gave an aid to, to British soldiers. To the enemy? To the enemy. And the, I'm going to tell you now the contradictory of all of that. And this is going to prove my point about war being brutal. And how war can brutalise you and make you into a very brutalised person if you're not careful. And I was determined that the Irish, me, as an individual, and the Irish people were not going to be brutalised by the British. And I wasn't going to allow them to brutalise me anyway, but there. So, in, 19, in, in February 1973, there was four young fellows, there were six of them killed all There was two killed at the top of the New York Road by a drive pass shooting by the, the, the FRC, which is the, the Army Reconnaissance thing, they were an undercover agent by the British Army. 
19, that night, about 12 o'clock, the 1st Battalion of the Queen's Regiment, and bearing in mind that I had rendered first aid to two of their members, one was time with the priest and the other one was shortly after. They opened fire and they killed four people on the New Lord's Road that night. I had made a run from my house across the New Lord's Road to the Circle Bar. This has haunted me all my life. This has never left me. I was a young man with a daughter. I wasn't long married to baby with my name, which I was my mother. Eight or nine or twelve months. And I got the arm rose. And as I was going through the door of the Circle Club, I dropped my head. Just like that. And the bullet hit the wall above me. I could feel the dust from the wall hitting me. At the back of my head there. And I almost was lying on the ground. He had been shot in the head. There wasn't a whole lot I could do for him. But I, I bandaged up his head as best I could. And I'll never forget the hot blood running through my hands. Never. And I got the boys to call for an ambulance. And they called for the ambulance. And they called for an ambulance. There was four people that night dead. John Locker and another fellow for the same as out in the street. And another fellow around the corner. And we couldn't get to them. Because every time you put your head out you were shot. We eventually transpired a few hours later that the ambulances were sitting up on the Antrim Road. Three of them. And the British Army wouldn't let them in. There was no guns found. There was no residue of guns found. There were four totally, absolutely innocent people. The ARA weren't even active that night. Because the ARA unit, because I knew I would know where they were, they were in Ardoin. Because there was a fear in Ardoin that something was going to happen. And they were moved down the Ardoin from the Eloge Road. And a skeleton of staff was left, if you know what I mean. Mm. Ambrose died that night in my arms. And I said to myself, they knew, they knew those men were innocent, and yet they butchered them. And what kind of brutality can that do? And I sat there, and I tried to get, work my way around it. Now, I was being brutalised myself at the time by these events and other events. You know, between trying to claw stones off the McGuck's bar where there was 13 or 14 people killed and an explosion by the UVF and then the British Army at that time and then in the early 1971 before internment. Or to McLaughlin's pub where when I got to him and pulled him after the bomb went off and I got into the, into the grounds and I found him blown against a diamond gate. Remember the old diamond gate? You pulled them across and there were stops on top of them and the thing. He was blown right against it. And when I pulled him off that gate, his front came out and his back stayed. 17 years of age. He went up to watch the Grand National on the television. And the UVF, with the coercion of the British Army, and the cooperation of the British Army, rolled a canister bomb into that pub that day and nobody got out that bomb was but he was the only one who was killed thank god there's no other kill, killing i had to go and tell that young i knew his mother very well because she lived up beside us now and kept the road and i had to go up and tell her what happened now that's only one or two of an example of the brutality of what happened when you go to the other side of that brutality, in February the four people were killed on the New Lodge Road. In May, the following May, there was a Royal Marine killed on the New Lodge Road in retaliation. Where's the winners? 
that was pure cycle brutality. And as a community being, brut being brutalized by a superior army against ordinary people. And that went on and on and on. And people became brutalized. The only thing that saved me was my upbringing. Otherwise, I could have done. I just could have become as brutal as they were. But I always remember in the back of my head: never let them bring you to their standard, because you're better than them, and we were better than them, and I proved that. And if somebody ever says to me, "What was your proudest moment?" That would be my proudest moment. And then someone said to me one day, after shortly after that, in the mid seventies, late seventies, who would you say was your best Republican Irish man? And he wasn't a Republican at all. It was Michael Smurfett. I had the honour of meeting Michael Smurfett on a couple of occasions, who in many a time could have moved his businesses abroad and left his businesses at home and paid his taxes at home and did all the things he should have done at home. And created the Smurfett Empire from Dublin. Not only not not like some of the people running about now who are living in tax havens and don't pay taxes in the country and bleed the country dry. And you know who I'm talking about when I'm saying that. That was the difference in those situations. Up until the end of Sunning Deal, we had the full support of the people of Ireland. In the governments might not have supported us, but the people supported us because the people understood. And that's what drove me. In 1978, I was diagnosed with... Um, post um, uh, stress. Post-traumatic yeah. stress. And I started drinking and I met Catherine and uh, my first marriage had broken up and destroyed and I had two children from that marriage. I met Catherine, a dunk, and um, two weeks after I met Catherine I stopped drinking and I haven't drank since. And I've never been happier. I've got all this other stuff buried in the back of my head. Mm. But Catherine saved me. There was no doubt about that. And did you stop activities, yes. all activities? All activities. You left? Left. I left. I republicanism? Left. Yes. Can you leave republicanism? Yes. Yeah. You can walk away? Yes. And I walked away. You walked away. And John walked away. And Billy walked away. And Oliver walked away. Because you couldn't justify after Sunning the and after after Storm was the main aim of the Kelly family, and I only talk for the Kelly family. I can't talk about Jerry Adams's family or I can't talk about Martin McGinnis's family. Or I admire Martin McGinnis and I admire Jerry Adams for what they've done. I may have difference of opinion with Jerry Adams as a person, but no one can deny what Jerry Adams has done. It's outstanding what he's done. But in 19, after Sunning Day was brought in, the people wanted to deal. We're not, I can't enforce under the people. I have to accept what the people, I'm a servant of the person, of the people. The people aren't servants of me. And that's the way it went. It went the other way. Where certain people, and I don't mind telling you, O'Connell, Rory Brady, and, and, and the Southern Command, wanted to continue the war, because all they were thinking about was Brits out of United Ireland in 1922. Rubbish. 1922 was dead and gone. What you needed to get was a better deal. And you had to sort out how you were going to do it. And at the end of the day, we had to talk. But and when the Storm, when the Storm of Agreement, when the, when the, when the Sunning Deal Agreement came with the SDLP and all the rest of it, the people would have, would have done that deal. And it was that point that the IRA should have stood down into a defensive organisation rather than an offensive organisation, which was what we wanted, and get into politics. But they hadn't got the political leadership. So you had gap like, 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 like Jerry Fitt and John Hume running around the place, and Paddy Devlin, who were Mayfairers. All of them. Never contributed anything. Never saw a drop of blood in their lives. Don't know what it is to carry a dead body. 
don't know what it is to have their homes blown up. Don't know what it is to see their children getting run off the street. Don't know what it is to have the RUC and the British Army coming into your house and pulling it apart. No, nothing. These people were in the power. But Sinn Féin, at that time, under O'Brady, had no political strategy. None. They had a never knew a document was Harry Ferry that was written by, 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 Jerry, by Jerry Adams in Long Cash in 1972. Aaron Ewer. Aaron Ewer. Do you read it? I always have a copy of it in the house from Bertha Shears. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of stuff was in it? Well, it was a, a, a confederate in Ireland with, with semi, with super cultures in Ulster Mayo, Ulster, Connaught and, and, and Leinster. Uh, 